Welcome back to our channel. I'm teacher Cedric, and today we are going to look at some calculation problems from the RI exam this year. Let us start with the first problem. Find the smallest integer n such that this equation is valid. Now, first thing first, on the left hand side, I have a lot of fractions, especially involving this n. So there is no way I can calculate this. Let us try to think how we could simplify this. We see that we have a lot of products in the denominator. And I know whenever I have products in the denominator, we can check if the numerator just so happen to be the difference between two numbers in the denominator. And in this case, yes. So for example, for this fraction, one over three times four, the numerator just so happen to be the difference between four and three, I can rewrite this fraction. I can split it into two easier fractions as one over three minus one over four. And applying this on the left-hand side, the left-hand side will simply become one over one minus one over two plus one over two plus one over three plus one over three, and it goes on. And you can notice that all the middle terms cancel each other, and we are only left with one minus one over n plus one which equals n over n plus one. So we have significantly simplified the left-hand side to just n over n plus one. And so now we know n over n plus one should be greater than one eight two three over two zero two three. Now what's the next step? We can do a cross multiplication to find that 200 times n must be greater than one eight two three. And from there, it is fairly simple to find out n must be greater than 9 and 223 over 200. And since we need to find the smallest integer of n, which is just n equals 10 in this case. So the final answer is 10. Now, the main takeaway of this question is that on the left hand side, even though it's quite complicated, we should try to think how we could simplify this problem. And with all the products in the denominator, it reminds us of this trick where I can split big fractions with products in the denominator into two smaller fractions and all the middle fractions cancel each other. Only the first and the last fraction remain. Now let us look at the next problem. Find in the integer parts of this big fraction here. Now, let me remind you, what does it mean to find the integer parts? For example, if I tell you I have a certain amount of money and the amount of money is between $20 to $20.5, well, even though you couldn't know the exact value of my money, at least you will know that my money will be 20 plus a small amount. Now, that's it. How do you find integer part? You need to first know the range. And in order to know the range, you need to know a number that is slightly smaller than the value that you're trying to find, and a number that is slightly larger than the value that you're trying to find. So for this fraction, what is a smaller value? That is just, I can replace all the 2023 to 2013. And this is very easy to calculate. And what is a slightly larger fraction than this? That is just one over 2,023, or until the last fraction is also one over 2,023. So how do I compute this? I have 11 one over 2,013 in the denominator. So this will simply equal 183. Now this is also fairly easy to calculate. This is just 183 and 10 over 11. So from here, we know that this fraction fall between 183 and 183 and 10 over 11. So the integer part of this fraction is 183. So the, well, the most important thing about this question is that in order to find integer part of this huge fraction, there's no need to find its exact value. You only need to find the range. You need to find a smaller value and a larger value. And then this integer, this fraction will fall between the range. That's how you solve this problem. Now let us move on to the next problem. Find the sum of the ninth row. Let's see, for the first sequence, for the first row, I have one, two. 
For the next row, I have one, three, two. And for the third row, I have one, four, three, five, two. So what is the pattern here? I take one, two, one, two, and then I take the sum of the adjacent numbers. This is where the three comes from. I write one, three, two, and then I find the sum of adjacent numbers. So in order to spot the pattern, let us first write up all the sum of these three rows. For the first one, the sum is three. And for the next row, it's six. For the next row, it's 15. Can you spot the pattern? To make it more obvious, let me write out all the difference between the sum. Now between three and six, the difference is three. And between six and 15, the difference is nine. And from here, you should notice that the difference is three to the power of one, three to the power of two. So the max value should be 15 plus three to the power of three. Let's check. So I write down one, four, three, five, two. So that the middle number will be five, seven, eight, seven. And if I do the summation, I will get 42, which is exactly 15 plus three to the power of three, which is 27. Now, how do you find the sum of the ninth row? So we simply take the starting value three plus nine, uh, sorry, plus three, plus three to the power of two, plus three to the power of three, and it goes on, on and on until you get three plus three plus three to the power of two until three to the power of eight. And that's the ninth row, the sum of the ninth row. But then how would you compute this? Now, first of all, we notice that this is a geometric sequence. Now, every number is the, the previous number multiplied with three. So the common ratio of this geometric sequence is three. Now, there's this one very special feature of, of a geometric sequence. That is, if I call this sequence S, if I multiply the whole sequence with three, I get three S equals three times three, three to the power of two, three to the power of two times three, three to the power of three, until all the way to three to the power of nine. In the next step, I can only take, I can simply take the second equation minus the first equation to get two S equals three to the power of nine minus three. So that S, which is the sum of this geometric sequence is just nine, eight, four, zero. So that the sum of all these terms will, will be just nine, eight, four, zero. So the sum of ninth row is just nine, eight, four, zero plus three, nine, eight, four, three. And that solves this problem. Now, even though I have found the pattern and found the sum of the ninth row, you might be wondering where does this pattern comes from? Let us investigate this pattern. Well, first of all, from the first row to the second row, what happened? I take one, two, and then I sum up one plus two. And from the second row to the third row, I take one, three, and two, and then I sum up one plus two, three, sorry, three plus two. And then from the second, from the third row to the fourth row, I take one, four, three, five, two, and then I add up one plus four, four plus three, three plus five, five plus two. So we see that whenever I go from the previous row to the next row, I have calculated all the previous numbers three more times, except the first number and the final number, the last number. Therefore, we can conclude that the sum of the next row is just this, the previous sum multiplied with three, since all numbers have been counted three times. But then for the first and the last term, the one and two, they have been only calculated, counted for two times. So I have to take away one plus two. And this is where the pattern comes from. Now, that's it for today. If you find this lesson useful, please subscribe to our channel, press the like button, and I'll see you soon.